Bearing Arms editor Cam Edwards explains the Remington settlement. Plus, Beto O'Rourke walks back his walk back on gun confiscation. That and more on this episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I made the devil run. I gave him poison just for fun. I had one fun. All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the Weekly Reload Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Gatowski, and I'm also the founder of TheReload.com, where you can... Ch- Buy yourself a uh, membership today if you want to get exclusive access to dozens of uh, reported articles and uh, analysis pieces. My brain went went uh, flat there for a second. Uh, I usually do those intros just go right through it because I'm used to it now. But but yes, we have uh, memberships for for our, our members. Uh, they get exclusive content you can't get anywhere else, and you get this podcast today early as well as the, the chance to appear on it. This week, we've got Cam Edwards from Bearing Arms with us. Hi, Cam. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you, Stephen? <laughs> I'm a little bit, uh, you know, flustered uh, to start. My, my brain just stopped working for <laughs> half a second there. Um, but your beard looks uh, fantastic, as as always. Um, people Thank you. People listening uh, on the podcast, you should check out the YouTube uh, broadcast of our show. Uh, over, over on YouTube, reload, and uh, you'll see this magnificent display that that Cam uh, brings to the table whenever he comes on. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you and your listeners and viewers uh, something I haven't even said on on my show on Cam and Company, but uh, the beard might be getting trimmed Ooh. significantly soon. Yeah, Miss E says she's ready for it to get chopped off a little. Well, bit. Well, so you gotta um, listen to the wife. Okay. Wow. I grew it out for her, yeah. so you know if she wants it uh, short, then I guess we're gonna maybe go for it short. But we got to do something big. You yeah, know? We gotta, I, I don't, I don't want to just like randomly show up and cut it. You know, we got to like this was grown out in support of her and lung cancer. So I'm thinking there's got to be like some sort of auction we can do, like yeah. per inch. Maybe we could donate to a lung cancer foundation, something like that. But uh, hey, you know, we're working on it. We would be all for promoting that here at the Reload. So once you come up with an idea. Of how you want to do that, let us know. I'll have you back on. Okay. Um, I'm still longing to keep it, but uh, you know, if it's got to go, it's got to go. I think it's long so, enough now yeah. that you could definitely donate it to one of those uh, charities that makes hair for for people going through. Uh, you could make a whole wig out of that that thing. Well, if, you know, I mean, not to be selfish, but I could probably use that myself <laughs> here. You know, if we're going to go that route, so Absolutely. we'll see. Um, but uh, so today we're we're going to talk about uh, this big development out of. The Sandy Hook lawsuit against Remington. Uh, there's a big settlement that just came down where the families of the victims are going to be awarded $73 million by Remington or really by Remington's insurers because Remington went bankrupt in this during this whole process and all their assets and operations got sold off. And what was left for this, this case were the insurance policies that the former company had held. And and so the insurers were ultimately the ones who who made this decision to settle with the group. But I want to get your your just general overview of what happened here. How did this? How do we get to this point where uh, a major gun company, or at least the remnants of one, are paying the victims of uh, a mass shooting that they weren't? You know, obviously Remington wasn't directly involved, and it was a Bushmaster rifle, which Remington owned at the time, was used in the in the shooting. But how do we get to this point where they're being held responsible for what happened? Yeah, well, you know, and first of all, I I don't know that it's actually. I mean, I haven't seen the details of the settlement, but I I, I would be shocked if uh, the insurer is actually admitted liability on behalf of of ROC. So. I don't know that it's fair to say that they're being held responsible. Certainly that's how it's framed. And I think that's going to be the takeaway, you know, from most people who see the headlines here. Um, But like the Associated Press in its first report, they said this was the first time that a gunmaker has been held liable for a mass shooting. They deleted that from subsequent reports. um, But... You know, by that point, I've I've seen multiple blogs and, and, you know, sort of news aggregator sites that have falsely uh, put that out there. So, um, you know, my first takeaway is that, you know, gun control groups got to win here. We can talk about the fact that this was, you know, insurers settling and not Remington itself, that no liability was uh, admitted. But the headlines and the takeaway is that a gun company was held responsible for Sandy Hook, whether that's right or wrong, uh, legally speaking. How we got here, I, I think, honestly, Stephen, 
I think how we got here was uh, through, I think, a very sympathetic court. Um, You know, we've got the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. It's been on the books since 2005. It's a federal law that is designed to prevent uh, gun makers from being sued for the criminal misuse of, of their products. Right. And it's I mean, that's 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 the gist of it. But the Connecticut State Supreme Court in a 4-3 decision uh, said that these families could pursue claims against Remington on one count only for violating Connecticut's Fair Trade Practices Act. So basically, they went after Remington for the marketing. Um, And the state Supreme Court said at the time, like, look, it's going to be a pretty, I think Herculean was the word that they used, a Herculean task to prove that the killer uh, in Newtown, Connecticut, was uh, th- th- there was a causal relationship between the the advertising by Bushmaster and the fact that this guy decided to murder a classroom full of first graders, uh, as well as killing his mom, as well as killing you know uh, uh, teachers and staff in that school, and that he specifically chose to use the gun that he stole from his dead mom because of the advertising uh, by Bushmaster. And I agree. I think that was a Herculean task. And I think it's why a lot of people really were within the industry and within the 2A community, not just surprised, but but shocked and, and disappointed that all of a sudden we got news of the settlement, um, knowing that it was the insurers that that, you know, decided to uh, to settle these claims, I think makes it a little bit more understandable. But, I, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen this case gone to trial uh, because I think it would have been very difficult to prove my look, I, you know, everybody's sympathy goes out to these family members uh, who are living and will continue to live with the pain of that awful day for the rest of their lives. But I do think that it was inappropriate uh, to say that Remington was to blame because of their advertising, advertising that we don't even know if the killer was even aware of. Um, And so that I think ultimately is how we got here. Now, why the insurance companies decided to settle you know, that's I guess we'd have to ask the insurers, but basically they paid out what they figured the full value of those claims would be. Uh, and so maybe it was a monetary decision. But one of the curious things about this uh, settlement um, is that apparently as part of the settlement, the insurers agreed that a lot of documents that the families had already obtained from Remington or the remnants of Remington could be released but that basically the fishing expedition would stop. Uh, they're not going to get any more documents. And so I, I I do wonder, I don't think there was anything particularly damning. I don't think there was an email out there from a Remington executive saying, hey, what if we market this gun to unstable young men? Um, I don't think that there's, you know, a, a quote unquote smoking gun, no pun intended email like that. Um, but I, I, I do wonder if that played any role in the decision to settle. I would, I, I honestly, I don't know. I can't, I can't imagine that the insurers would have a vested interest in the documents of a company that really no longer exists. Um, but again, there are, I think, some continued questions uh, about the settlement and why it actually took place. Yeah, I think there's a lot of continued questions. I mean, I share some of your surprise. I, I, I will say that obviously, in hindsight, it, it seems like this was going to be the outcome after the Supreme Court declined to intervene uh, the United States Supreme Court, because after the, the Connecticut Supreme Court made their decision, Remington appealed it to the U.S. Supreme Court, which did, didn't did take the case. It didn't offer an explanation for why it didn't ca- take the case, but it, it didn't. And it seems the trajectory from there was a couple months after the Supreme Court declined, Remington went into bankruptcy, probably in part because of this lawsuit, although not entirely because of it, I would I would imagine. We can talk about that a little more. Uh, in, in a minute, but uh, and then after that, uh, when the insurers were the ones left, you know, after uh, all the assets of Remington were sold, were sold off, because this is a confusing thing, I think, for a lot of people. Right, Remington still exists, or the brand still exists. Right. You can still buy Remington ammunition. You can buy Remington made guns. A lot of those operations are actually coming back online now that they've been sold off to other companies. It's just that the the and Remington has an ongoing independent company doesn't exist anymore uh, because it went bankrupt in uh, 2020. And uh, it it was already struggling before that. It had gone into bankruptcy in 2018. There were a lot of 
issues that we can get into later with beyond this this lawsuit, but certainly a big one was this lawsuit. Then after it was the assets were sold off, the insurers effectively took over control of this lawsuit because all that remained were their insurance policies that were valued up to seventy three million dollars, and they they. It only took them a couple months to try and start settling this case. They they first offered like thirty million dollars, right. which the plaintiffs rejected, uh, and then only a few months after that, they basically gave in to the full amount of their coverage, uh, which is where we're at. That's what happened this week, and so the timeline there is is fairly clear. I think as the the Supreme Court, the, the, I mean, it's a combination of the Connecticut Supreme Court's ruling and then the the United States Supreme Court refusing to intervene at that point uh, led to this path. But there are, you know, like you said, it's still a lot of things that just, it's hard to understand why the insurers thought this was the best course of action. Um, and I do want to drill down for a moment on what you mentioned in terms of uh, how this has been reported and what's what's important to note, right? It, this was not a court ruling or a jury's decision. This was a settlement uh, between the plaintiffs in this case and the defendants, the, the uh, which effectively became the insurers of Remington after it went bankrupt. And so it doesn't have any legal, it doesn't set any legal precedent. There's no, there, there's nothing directly impacting the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, which is the federal liability protections for for gun makers and dealers uh, that that it was designed in the 90s to um, counteract exactly these kinds of lawsuits. Because this, again, the suit's not a new tactic. Right. It's a new strategy. It's a new strategy. They, they've come up with a, a way that they believe they can get around the, the PLCAA by going, because PLCAA, one of the exceptions is if, if you've broken a state law, uh, then the PLCAA liability protections don't apply in that circumstance. And so the argument here goes that Remington or really its subsidiary Bushmaster broke Connecticut's advertising laws because its advertising was too aggressive. Um, There was a, you know, one of the ones they pointed to was um, your consider your man card reissued with a picture of the rifle uh, that was a big centerpiece of this case. And then also the rifle was featured in a video game, uh, Medal of Honor, which was popular years ago, but it's similar to Call of Duty. If people know that franchise. You're making me feel old but, by it, trying to explain well. the Medal of Honor franchise, by the way. Steve. Yeah, Thank Medal you. of Honor. They haven't made that game in <laughs> quite a long time now. But back in 2012, um, that it was a... It was obviously a, a pop. It was, a, it was sort of the last legs of the franchise, and they had a game where it featured. Most video games feature fake names for the guns, and I guess this lawsuit is probably part of the reason for that because uh, Medal of Honor featured the real names of actual guns uh, in the video game, and uh, that that was so. There's a violent video game aspect of this case where they're arguing that because Remington uh, put its guns in this video game. Um, put the names of them that contributed to uh, it's, that this was illegal, um, unfair business practice under Connecticut law. It, honestly, the whole thing is a little bit hard to even get your head around because obviously these these they're advertising to which to, this was directed at people who could legally purchase these right. guns and then you have the on, on the other well, hand, I mean, this is why i think the facts of the case is he didn't buy the gun anyway which I, and, yeah, I mean, and as I, you noted there's no i think that's that why it gets back evidence. to the you know state supreme court saying it was going to be a herculean task to, to actually prove these allegations because you're right i mean first of all think about how many people played the call of or excuse me the the medal of honor franchise how many millions of people there were who played that franchise um it seems to be like you know blaming Sandy Hook on a video game is is kind of like, you know, blaming a crime on an Ozzy Osbourne album back in the 1980s or, you know, Judas Priest made me do it. Um, it, it just it doesn't it doesn't resonate. I mean, if video games were the 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 proximate cause uh, of, of this, you know, shooting, 
frankly, we would see a lot more of that because these video games are incredibly popular. You know, we're dealing with a, a terribly damaged individual here. Um, and again, there were all kinds of warning signs. There were failures on the part of uh, his own mom to actually, you know, get him the treatment that was needed. Um, I, you know, but again, that, that none of that really mattered to the argument that the families were making or the attorneys for the families were making, which, as you say, was that, you know, these advertisements or, or you know, this video game placement violated the uh, Fair Trade Practices Act in Connecticut. And I don't know if you've looked at that law, Steve, but, you know, they they list like, you know, everything from like arborists to zookeepers. Basically, you know, they've got their list of regulations. Firearms is not in there. They don't have a specific category for firearms advertising. They have it for alcohol. They don't have it for guns, though. Uh, and so, again, I mean, I think it speaks to the challenge that the plaintiffs would have had to, to, to demonstrate conclusively that, yeah, that these advertisers were the, was a, was a proximate cause uh, of this tragedy. On the other hand, you know, I think that one of the concerns for the insurers may have been People want to hold someone accountable for this crime, and they can't hold the killer accountable, can't hold his mom accountable. Um, so will they hold, you know, Remington Outdoor Company or the insurers of Remington Outdoor Company responsible because they're the ones that are there? Uh, and if you get this case in front of a sympathetic jury, I, I firmly believe that the Connecticut State Supreme Court allowed this case to go forward on this one claim Precisely because they didn't want to be the body that said, no, you can't sue. You can't try to find some sort of relief or justice. Um, I think that the the sympathies of the court were with this family, which allowed this lawsuit to proceed. And I, I think one of the genuine concerns was probably that there'd be a sympathetic jury as well. Um, so, you know, on the merits of this case, I, I don't think that the plaintiff's attorneys had a really strong case at all. But I don't think that might have... Uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, that might not have been the most important factor or consideration. That's a good point. Um, and, you know, my my own point of view, and I wrote about this uh, over at the Reload, um, for how this happened or why they might have decided to try and settle instead of continuing to fight. Uh, has, you know, there's, there's a couple factors, right? One is how long this case had already dragged out. This is, you know, the, the, when they filed this in 2015, and it was still going here in 2022. Uh, so presumably that it already cost Remington um, and perhaps the insurers as well millions of dollars to defend this case through to this point, uh, which to, frankly is part of the tactic of these sorts of suits. They, it's really the merits of the case aren't always even the, the main point of filing a right. suit like this. You're trying to cause bad publicity you're trying to uh force them to pay a lot of uh, you know money and legal fees and you're trying to get access to their documents uh, and you're using whatever legal strategy you can find to to get the, i mean that, that that goes to your point here that the supreme connecticut supreme court dismissed two other uh, arguments which really were you know the the advertising argument um it focuses on how they marketed the guns but the other two arguments were just about the fact that they sold these guns at all, essentially. Uh, you know, they, they said it was the AR-15 is a weapon of war and shouldn't be entrusted to civilians. Um, and that was a big thrust of the other two arguments that they had made in this case. So they're kind of just throwing everything at the wall to see what would stick. And the advertising one was obviously much more successful. But uh, you ha so you had the, the length of time that they had already fought this and the, the likelihood that it was going to continue to go on for years um, moving forward, even if they were would eventually win on the merits. Um, so that would cost a lot of money. And then I think the other thing is that uh, a lot of people didn't expect it to get this far in the first place. Like a lot of people thought this would be thrown out as many similar cases have been thrown out in the past before they ever got to discovery. And so... I guess if you're an insurer and you have no real ideological dog in the fight, you're not concerned about encouraging these sorts of lawsuits perhaps in the future against your company because there is no more Remington company. It's just these insurance policies. Um, and you're not really worried about the industry effects because you're an insurer, you're not a gun company. Um, so perhaps uh, they noticed that 
everyone thought these would get this case would get thrown out before discovery, and then it didn't. And perhaps they just weren't willing to take the risk that what everyone thinks about the merits of the case being weak is wrong too. Uh, and and then obviously you have the the potential political sympathies of judges or or juries along the way to consider too in a highly politicized case like this that you as you noted. So I think those factors maybe help explain it a little bit better as to why this this happened. But I want to get your thoughts now on what the effects are going to be of this settlement. You know, we talked a little bit about how it's not a legal precedent, but it's probably going to have serious effects, right, on the industry? I think it has a potential uh, to have serious effects. I mean, so, you know, again, the, 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 the I think one of the big issues here is the fact that the Supreme Court did not intervene. Um, you know, it could have. I mean, let's say that let's say the insurers decided not to settle this case, went to trial. Let's say a, a verdict was returned. Um, at that point, the insurers could have appealed that verdict up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court could have stepped in and said, actually, yeah, you know what? This whole thing violates the PLCAA. Um, but, you know, I think until the Supreme Court weighs in, we are going to see this as the blueprint going forward. And it's not going to be in every state, right? I mean, there, there are certain conditions um, that that uh, you know have to be met here. You've got to have a you know, some sort of you know marketing and and uh, advertising law on the books that you could use. Um, you've got to have an anti-gun attorney general uh, or anti-gun plaintiffs attorneys. We're seeing, you know, because we're seeing this in New Jersey right now, uh, where uh, it, this was started by uh, Gruel, the former AG, and it's now uh, the, the new AG. I'm blanking on his name. Uh, is continuing this same sort of effort against Smith and Wesson, uh, basically using the you know marketing laws to do a document dive into Smith and Wesson's practices. Uh, we're also seeing you know the government of Mexico uh, suing fourteen different gun makers right now in federal court in Boston, um, basically alleging that you know the uh, the the gun makers are are marketing guns and cartel members are picking up on the advertising. If it weren't for the darn you know advertising, the cartel violence in Mexico wouldn't be nearly as bad as it is. So there are some some opportunities I think for the court to step in here, if. Either of those cases proceeds like right now, I think the uh, the government of Mexico case is uh, before a federal judge who's trying to decide if this case is going to go forward at all. Um, if the judge does allow this to proceed, then again, we're going to get the opportunity for the Supreme Court to eventually weigh in. And I think that's what needs to happen here, um, because if you go back and you read the the actual language of the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, when they talk about these you know marketing and trade practices, I, I don't think that Congress really meant that you could that was just an open ended invitation, you know, for uh, if, as long as they're advertising, well, you can sue them for any crime that was committed with their gun. Um, it, it seemed to me like they were talking about, you know, really deceptive advertising, things that uh, violated the law, not something that somebody might thought uh, uncouth uh, or something of that nature. Um, unfortunately, you know, I don't see Congress, uh, uh, revising the protection of lawful commerce and arms act anytime soon. So it ultimately is going to be up to the courts. And until the Supreme court says something, yeah, I mean, the gun control lobby has a green light right now to try to use, uh, you know, these laws in places like California, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, to continue to go after the industry. And, I, you know, I think they're going to continue to try to use the marketing uh, argument, the advertising argument. But we've also seen them try to use the argument, Steve, in the past couple of years. Brady, I know, for instance, did this in a lawsuit filed in California, arguing that uh, the Protection of Lawful Crimes and Armed Act should not apply to lawsuits in which AR-15s were used because AR-15s are like machine guns. Uh, basically arguing that there's like a, you know, a, 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 an inherent design feature uh, that makes these guns unsafe, right? Uh, it makes them readily converted to machine guns. And so therefore they should be covered under the NFA. Uh, they shouldn't be sold to civilians. So you're right. It's part of that kitchen sink strategy. They're throwing anything and everything up there and seeing what might be able to sneak past and get through the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act. And I think they're just going to be more emboldened uh, to engage in that strategy until the courts step in and say, no, you can't do this. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. You know, I, I don't, given that it's a settlement and not a ruling, I don't know that it's going to have any sort of practical legal implication in future cases like this. But the fact is, 
it's going to absolutely encourage uh, gun control activists to file more cases like this and to try and follow this exact same path because it's the first one to be this successful. Uh, and so you're going to see a lot more of this. I mean, even just getting to discovery is a big deal for them in these cases, because then you can go through and, uh, you know, go through all the documents that whatever gun company has. And they, they obviously view this uh, and they talk about it the same way as when uh, the government went after tobacco companies and, and their marketing and, and so forth and how they uh, restricted that industry. They want to do the same thing with guns. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's not the Sandy Hook settlement is interesting because there's nothing really unique about what they did other than that they were fairly successful with it in the end. Uh, but that I think has a practical implication of causing more suits like this to be filed. And then also, do you think that this is going to raise insurance rates for gun manufacturers? Uh, you know, perhaps insurers will look at this settlement and want to demand a higher premium to insure these uh, makers in the future. Do you think that's a, a potential immediate impact as well? Yeah. I mean, you know, listen, I'm not a, an actuary or uh, an expert on the insurance industry, but I, I mean, that stands to reason that that might be, um, you know, one of the reactions from the industry. Although again, it, it, it was the, it was the insurers themselves that ended up settling in this case. Um, and, you know, I think you, you talked about this in one of your pieces at the reload that a gun company that is still in existence um, I, I think is, is going to have, um, you know, motivation to, to keep fighting, right. To not settle, to actually go to court. And again, we're seeing this right now in New Jersey with the, uh, the Smith and West Smith and Wesson investigation. Um, you know, Smith and Wesson hasn't said, okay, we're going to cave. I mean, first of all, they know what the current people who run Smith and Wesson know what happened to Smith and Wesson's reputation, you know, during the Clinton administration. Um, so, you know, right. there's there's a couple of factors, right. I think, at work that are going to keep the firearms manufacturers in these legal fights. And, and one is uh, you don't win by caving, uh, but but B, the consumer backlash uh, to caving. Right. But, you know, for the for the for the plaintiffs here, for the for the gun control advocates, um, I think it's interesting because they do have, I think, an advantage in in one way in that. They don't necessarily have to get a big verdict for them to get a win, right? As you say, if they just have access to internal documents that they wouldn't have had access to otherwise, that's a win, right? Uh, if they can, you know, drag out these lawsuits for seven years and force gun companies to continue to pay attorney's fees for seven years, that's a win. Because a lot of these plaintiffs are, are operating with the help of gun control groups. They're providing pro bono legal uh, advice and legal representation. So... I think uh, even even when they lose, mm -hmm. it's kind of a win in these sorts of cases because the headlines you get when these cases fail is that the gun company gets or is the, the victim's families are right. forced to pay the gun company for their for their legal fees, and that's often framed in a, in a obviously in a negative way when it gets covered in the press. You've seen this a, a number of times where. Uh, the, these previous suits have failed and then the gun companies recover their legal costs and, and they end up uh, having to be paid by victims' families. And so you get a, the, even that coverage of that tends to be a, you know, positive because people feel like that's not, you know, obviously, like you said at the, the top of this, you know, everyone is sympathetic to the Sandy Hook family because of the horrific thing that, that happened to them. And, you know, whatever they feel about the gun issue, they might feel good that the victims' families got paid a lot of money at the end of this uh, because, you know, that they deserve some sort of restitution, even if you don't agree with how it came about, right? I mean, and so when a victim's family is forced to pay the legal fees of someone else in a, that they're suing, that can also induce that same sort of sympathetic reaction from a lot of people in the public. So, so yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of incentives for why these cases keep happening. Yeah. You, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's not just the, it's not just a court of law that these, you know, that this plays out in. it's the court of public opinion as well. Um, and, and you're right. I think there's some structural advantages uh, given the media environment 
uh, for gun control groups, you know, in terms of, of, of winning the, uh, the, the court of public opinion, um, at, at least in the larger public. Now, again, I, I don't, I, I, I don't know that that's always going to be the case. These are again, generally very sympathetic individuals. Um, but at, I don't know that that applies to the gun control groups. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, you know, I think people have a lot of respect and sympathy for uh, sure. crime victims. But at a time in which, again, we've seen millions of new gun owners uh, embrace their right to keep their arms over the past couple of years. We've got, you know, violent crime rates that are uh, skyrocketing in city after city across the country. And more and more people are, are turning uh, to their Second Amendment rights to uh, to be protected. I, I I don't I don't think that trying to uh, sue the firearms industry into uh, you know oblivion uh, is actually a, a strategy that's going to win a lot of hearts and minds for the uh, the gun prohibition lobby. Quite frankly, I, I think that's a fair point too. I think um, the concept at the heart of these cases is something a lot of people uh, in the general public would also naturally reject. The idea that uh, a gun maker is liable for the criminal actions of a third party when they had no uh, connection to what that person did um, go, you know, is comes off as wrong to most people on a sort of basic level. You know, you obviously hear a lot of the comparisons to trying to sue Ford if a drunk driver hits you, you know, similar idea there. And I think natural people have a natural, um, opposition to that. So that, yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, you know, to me, when I think about this case, I just keep coming back to the calculation that these insurers made. I don't really fully understand it. Uh, you know, I can look at it and say, well, they, they came up with the, idea. you know, they're, they're just doing a numbers game. They they don't care about the politics or the implications for the gun industry of a settlement like this. They just want, want to, they're risk adverse, right? Naturally as insurers, and they, they are going to come in, they're going to calculate, okay, here's what our percentage of losing this case is and having to pay out a, a big settle, you know, a big uh, penalty at the end um, versus plus, you know, and then add that to what we're going to pay in legal fees over the, the course of fighting this case um, and the uncertainty of whether or not the Supreme Court would come to our aid if we did get uh, unfavorable juries or, or judges along the way. And at the end of it, that, that number they came up with was higher than $73 million that they ended up paying. But, you know, it's just so hard to look at the argument in the case and, and imagine why they felt it was likely enough that they would lose on the merits to do this. I, you know, and again, I think this is probably where it, it really was a cost benefit analysis. Um, you know, you look at the lawsuit that uh, some of the families filed um, in Parkland, Florida, against the federal government uh, for failing to prevent that attack. And I think the federal government settled for one hundred and twenty seven million dollars, uh, you know, because in part the, the FBI did not send on a warning about uh, the killer there to the FBI a field office in Miami, just kind of sat on that information. Um, the families of the Sutherland Springs victims sued the Air Force, and I think they also uh, either obtained a verdict or got a settlement of over $100 million. So that, you know, th those those may have been calculations yep. on the part of the insurers, too, looking at the payouts. Now, granted, this is the federal government we're talking about, but still looking at those similar payouts and saying, OK, um, we could very easily be looking at a, you know, 100 plus million dollar uh, a, a verdict. Uh, and if they don't agree to this, we could be looking at a 100 plus million dollar settlement. So let's sure. offer them the full, you know, what it would cost us if we paid out every claim in full and, and see what happens. Um, and in that case, you know, they, the insurers may have saved themselves, you know, 25 million plus dollars. Uh, I don't I don't know if that was a, a factor, but I, I, I did look up those those numbers for Sutherland Springs and Parkland the other day because I was curious to see how they compared. And they were both both much bigger settlements uh than uh, than what we saw actually with uh, the with the Remington case. Yeah, and, and you're probably right. Like that probably is what you would look at in a case like this. Uh the similar circumstances of, as far as uh, the tragic nature of, of these events and the horrific nature of these attacks. Um but but obviously, you know, it, you look at the cases and you at least as, you know, neither one of us are lawyers, so 
you know, I, I don't, I don't know how this would go over in court. Other than that, we've watched a lot of these cases play out through the years, but it seems like the Sutherland Springs families and the Parkland families had a better cases because there was actual negligence on the part of the FBI or the Air Force in both those cases. Like the, their actions conceivably direct, directly led to uh, this event happening, or at least, uh, you know, it allowed for it to happen. Whereas the case against Remington is is so much more of a stretch uh, in terms of the arguments there. You know, we, we uh, you know, we've gone over it already a couple times here, but like there's no evidence that at a, that the shooter in this case saw any of this advertising, which and then even if he had, he wasn't the one who bought the gun anyway. It was his mother whom he stole it from and killed in order to go on this rampage. And then. Uh, you know, looking at the actual advertisements they're talking about, too, you know, is the consider your man card reissued advertisement like gauche or like kind of stupid? Sure. Does it encourage people to commit mass murder? No. Like, I, it's hard to it's hard to understand uh, why they felt like they were much more they were at least likely enough to lose this case that they agreed to pay out such a huge settlement without ever even going to the merits. They didn't even test this in court at all. And uh, that's where it gets confusing to me. That's all. Yeah, and to me, this is one of the reasons why I, I don't know that this actually does set a lot of precedent going forward. I mean, yes, it is going to encourage more of this from, uh, you know, gun control groups uh, who can, you know, work with these uh, victims, families, but at the same time, you know, like you and I have talked, I think the considerations of a functional working gun company are very different uh, than the considerations of, you know, the insurers of of what remains of, uh, you know, the remnants of Remington Outdoor Company. So I, I think you will see, because I think ultimately that's what that's what I, I, I sense from you, Steve, is like, I don't understand how you could look at the weakness of this evidence and say, OK, let's go ahead and settle. Um, and I don't know that we're ever going to understand that unless we talk to these insurers, uh, you know, directly. Who aren't talking exactly, but, um, you know, the National Student Sports Foundation in its statement kind of highlighted, look, this wasn't an, a firearms company that that settled this. Uh, and I think the expectation is a, an actual working gun company would fight this because they would say, no, this isn't. I mean, look at the evidence here. You're going to try to tell me that because I, you know, put an ad in a, a gun magazine that somebody may or may not have even seen that that was the cause of them, uh, you know, criminally using this product uh, and that it's somehow my fault and not theirs. I, yeah, I think I, I think, you know, again, we're going to see these fights continue to play out. And none of these cases, you know, here's the other interesting thing. None of these cases have ever gone to trial. They've either been tossed out by a judge or they've been, you know, settled before they go to trial in this case. Uh, but. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, these cases don't go to trial because a judge says there's no case here. Um, and I think that's going to continue uh, to be the outcome of the vast majority of these cases that are filed. Um, but again, the death by a thousand cut strategy, let's just you know keep suing, mm -hmm. keep suing, keep suing and, and see what happens. Like I said, that's going to continue. And ultimately, it's going to be up to the Supreme Court to step in and say, look, here's what the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act actually means. Yes, it's constitutionally valid. Uh, and here's where you cannot sue and here's where you can. Um, it's I, I, because right now I think the law is absolutely being abused. Yeah. And to be fair to the Supreme Court, I think, first of all, I think those are all really good points. Um, and, and good reason to think that perhaps this settlement isn't going to be as impactful as you might think on the surface, right? especially the way it was first reported by a lot of places with, uh, you know, the point you made earlier about this doesn't really set a legal precedent in any way, and they're not necessarily admitting liability by settling in this in this manner. But to the point of the Supreme Court, too, I, I would mention that even though I think their decision not to in intervene here at that point in the case ultimately probably was a major cause of, of how this went down, there is good reason for why they might not intervene because there was no actual, uh, there had no been no arguments on the merits. Uh, you had a novel claim going on here that didn't really have any actual case law 
built around it. There wasn't much in in the form of uh, a case for them to actually examine, uh, other than just outright saying there's, uh, you know, the, the PLCAA completely uh, cuts off any any sort of deliberation over this at all. Um, so they they perhaps wanted more of a record to review, uh, and maybe if it had gone to the merits and and Remington or the insurers had ended up losing, perhaps the court would have taken it again. Plus, the court is different than it was in 2019 uh, when it decided not to intervene in this case. So there are reasons to think that while Congress is extremely unlikely to do anything on the PLCAA, especially with President Joe Biden in office, who literally, uh, that is his number one priority is, is repealing, <laughs> at least when he talks publicly, that's his like least favorite gun law. Uh, at the federal level, but he's not going to sign some sort of fix to it, I, I would imagine. Um, and, but the Supreme Court might intervene, um, or is much more likely to. And so per perhaps it's not the end of the world, uh, you know. And you know, it's not the end of the world. And you do make a really good point about um, it might have it really might have been too early for the court to intervene at that point. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm I'm really keeping my eyes on this um, government of Mexico case uh, in Boston, and if the federal judge allows that case to actually proceed, I am going to be really curious to see what, if anything, the Supreme Court has to say about it. Because now, now again, we've got some other issues that are implicated here. Can a foreign government uh, sue U.S. gun makers, you know, for violating supposedly violating uh, trade practices here in the United States? It this does give the court, I think, another chance to uh, to intervene and weigh in. Um, and, and again, maybe the record is going to be a little, er, you know, early, but I, I don't think so at this point, because I think at that point, the question then becomes, look, is this even allowed, uh, under the protection of lawful commerce and arms act or is this claim, should this claim even go forward? Um, so I think the, the court is going to, if that case is not tossed out by the, uh, U S district judge, um, the Supreme court will have another chance to take a bite at this. And, you know, I, I, I hope that they do, um, because, again, in the meantime, this is just going to continue to be another strategy deployed by, you know, blue state politicians. Uh, and it's not always going to be, you know, uh, victims, family members. I mean, again, the New York law that allows people to sue under the uh, public nuisance statute uh, not only empowers private citizens to do so, but the attorney general. Uh, and, you know, Letitia James, Steve, seems to have an interest in. Uh, you know, the Second Amendment and organizations and entities and maybe even manufacturers of firearms as well. So, you know, it would not shock me to see Letitia James announce that she was pursuing litigation against a, a gun maker uh, or Rob Bonta out in California. Right. S certainly not. But hey, Let Letitia James, the New York attorney general, she's just looking out for the NRA members, uh, as you know, as you well know, well know. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah, she, that's her only interest is uh, whether or not the NRA right. is well run uh, and not what it's doing in terms of its advocacy. <laughs> I'm sure we all we all believe that, <laughs> uh, certainly. But <laughs> uh, that's for another podcast. Uh, appreciate you coming on and, and giving us your view on all of this as somebody who's extremely well informed on on the issue and on all things relating to gun uh, politics nationwide. Uh, can you tell people where they can find more of your writing on this topic and other gun news? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you as always for the invite. I always love getting a chance to hang out with you, whether it's virtually or in person. Um, so yeah, folks can just go to bearingarms.com. I'm the editor there. Uh, you know, we're posting stories each and every day, focusing on uh, second amendment issues. It's a, it's a, it's not, I will say it's, 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 Steve and I don't really step on each other's toes because, you know, we're not doing these sort of, generally speaking, we're not doing these sort of in-depth reporting uh, that Steve does, which it's, you know, a sort of a lighter, breezier take on the, uh, the day's top stories. Um, I think it's very complimentary to what the reload does, you know? I, I Yeah, I think so. I think that they, they're, yeah. Technically we're competitors, but I think there's a lot of complimentary stuff. Somebody who enjoys reading the reload will most likely enjoy reading Bearing Arms as well. And vice versa. Right. And if you like the podcast, you'll probably really enjoy Bearing Arms Cam and Company, which is the show that we do Monday through Thursday. Uh, very interview driven like this program is. Um, and, you know, we have a daily armed citizen story. We talk about uh, the, the criminal justice system. We've got a segment called the Recidivist Report where every day and we're never a shortage of stories here, but every day it's just, OK, here's somebody that the system could have taken care of if we had just enforced the existing laws. And instead we 
you know, give them a slap on the wrist and put them back on the street. And now they're accused of a, a, a more violent and heinous crime. Uh, and then we have a, a good deed of the day where it's just, I don't know about you, Steve, I get so just like, blah, everything sucks when I watch the news. So I want to have at least like just something good, somebody doing something good for somebody else. It's generally not Second Amendment related, but uh, it's, you know, it's two or three minutes of the show. So I don't mind going off topic a little bit, but uh, folks can find that on all of the major podcast platforms, as well as YouTube and Rumble, if you want to get a look at the the big beard before it uh, maybe disappears. Absolutely. And you guys have a, a VIP membership as well. We do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes. If, if you, uh, you know, want to go above and beyond your reload membership, you can always become a VIP member uh, at barryandarms.com. That will give you exclusive stories, commentary as well. Um, you can even upgrade to a VIP gold membership, which will give you all of that content from all of Town Hall Media's uh, a library and family of websites from, you know, red state to townhall.com, hot air. Uh, you get access to all kinds of cool uh, live uh, live chats, uh, streaming events. I do a weekly uh, live chat with Ed Morrissey from hot air. That's always a lot of fun. So yeah, you can find out more, just go to barryandarms.com slash subscribe. I highly recommend it. And I highly recommend watching Cam and company. It's one of my favorite shows out there and has been for years. Cam is, is been doing this for a long time. <laughs> well, thank you. I would highly recommend watching this, but people already are. So I don't think my recommendation is going to do any good. But if this is your first time, keep watching. Keep listening because Steve is great. All right. Well, we'll have you on again soon in the future here, Cam. Thank you so much. Thanks, Stephen. All right. And now we're here with the weekly news update. Uh, how are you doing today, Steve? I'm doing good. How are you, Jake? I'm doing well. Um, we got a couple big stories in the news to talk about this week. Uh, first of all, Beto's back in the news. Um, can't get enough of Beto lately, yeah. it seems. Uh, you wrote a nice piece about two two related stories. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. About, about him. But you wrote a, a good piece about um, some comments he made, sort of backtracking once again on his gun stance. If you want to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, he sort of walked back to his walk. Back, <laughs> right. Uh, so. Back in 2019, Beto O'Rourke, during a primary debate for the Democratic nomination for president, he he made some very infamous, famous, infamous uh, comments on his desire to confiscate AR-15s and AK-47s. He said, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15s, your AK-47s. Very clear position. Right. Right? That, that was This was sort of uh, after his campaign had, had receded to the single digits and uh, he was looking for a way to jumpstart it uh, as the, the primary had moved along into its later states. And it didn't work. <laughs> um, uh, he actually pulled worse after that uh, and then dropped out about two months later. But now he's running for governor of Texas, right? And Texas is a very gun-friendly state, uh, as I, we'll get to a little bit in your, your piece on the polling that was just released sure. there uh, recently. But and so a lot of people thought, oh, he's going to have to backtrack on this statement uh, to have a chance of competing against the incumbent governor, you know, Republican Greg Abbott. But instead, he doubled down when he first announced his run for governor uh, and said he stood by those comments back in November when he announced his campaign. And he he, he was very adamant that he, you know, he doesn't think there should be AR-15s and AK-47s on the streets of Texas. But last week, during a campaign stop in Tyler, Texas, he changed his tune. Right. He told a supporter who asked him a question that uh, he doesn't want to take anything from anybody and that what he really wants to do is defend the Second Amendment. Uh, this seems to be a direct contradiction to his previous position, right, to anyone listening. Right to these comments. And this made a lot of news. And we talked about it last week on the podcast. It was sort of really odd, the timing of all this uh, and the way he went about it. And I wrote a member's piece that discussed that at length. But now, in a piece published by the New York Times, they interviewed him shortly after those comments. And he said, again, that he does not take back his stance. He isn't changing his stance on confiscating AR-15s and AK-47s. And so he's reverted once more to this position of confiscation, which is just uh, 
irritating. Right. I don't know what, what to call Bit it. Bit of a whiplash effect. Yeah, you know, he, he's completely reversed himself. Yeah, you're, you're, you're sort of, your head's spinning trying to follow what he's, what position Beto O'Rourke has on this issue now. And I, we've reached out to his campaign twice now with an attempt to get some clarification of what exactly he believes and what exact, what policy he would pursue. Like, man, is this mandatory buyback situation? Right. Like what, you know, the vice president Kamala Harris has supported in the past or representative Eric Swalwell from the Democrat from California. It's something he brought up during the presidential primary as well. Um, or, or, you know, what, <laughs> what's going on here? And, and he ha they haven't responded. Uh, his website doesn't really give a lot of additional detail either. It just says that um, he doesn't believe there should be AR-15s and AK-47s on the streets of Texas. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's hard to figure out what he's doing here. It's a very confusing approach. Um, and in fact, uh, it sort of goes against the polling too, right? Because you wrote about a recent poll out of Texas, correct? Sure, yeah. So, so even polling uh, from last year showed he was already in a bit of a hole on gun policy. There was a 27-point spread between Abbott and O'Rourke uh, in terms of, which is, which yeah, is massive, huge. massive for an issue. 60% um, of Texas voters said they preferred Abbott to O'Rourke on gun policy. Uh, but around the same time that he was re-reversing himself, I guess, this week when you wrote your piece, another uh, poll came out from the University of Texas, um, where among other things, they show that Abbott has a 10-point <clears throat> lead over O'Rourke, which is pretty consistent with what we've seen in other polls. But it also showed that uh, a seven-year low uh, amount of Texas voters support stricter gun laws, but only 43% compared to uh, a combined total of 50% that would rather have laws stay the same or be less strict. Um, so he's still, uh, his position is still out of line with the Texas electorate more broadly if these polls are, are accurate. You know, that, that was sort of one of the reasons that we had to explain his initial sure. reversal when he went back on the pledge to take people's ARs. Because you could just look at the polling and think, oh, well, this is this is why he decided to reverse himself. Of course, then the question is like, why wouldn't you do that at the time you were launching your campaign? Because I think everyone assumed that these numbers would be bad for him if he kept that position. And even afterwards, you know, you obviously, I think a lot of people are just not going to believe a reversal from Beto at this point. Maybe, maybe that's yeah. why they reversed back. I, I don't know. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it's a it's a strange situation, I think. Well, you see, you see in his most recent comments, you put him in the piece. Uh, he's sort of kind of kind of trying to split the difference at this point where he talks about how, how he still doesn't think they should have ARs and AKs on the streets. But he's just focusing on what he can do, what he thinks he can get done in Texas. So he's kind of one on one hand playing, oh, these assault weapons shouldn't exist. But on the other hand, I'm not going to do anything about it because it just won't happen. Um, so he's kind of trying to find a middle ground, but it's kind of odd to do that coming off of last week's news. Yeah, he says, uh, quote, I'm just telling you I'm going to focus on what I can actually do as governor and where the common ground is. Uh, and then he, he said, uh, I haven't changed a thing about his position on taking AR-15s. Um, and he, his strategy so far on guns seems to be attacking Greg Abbott for signing permitless carry into law last year. Um, he calls that um, ex you know, extremism sure. on gun policy. And uh, so, but, but obviously it's sort of a hard argument to make when you <laughs> hold the most extreme position on gun policy in the other direction, that it's a position that even the gun control groups have uh, disowned they, you know, they've, the common refrain is that nobody wants to take your guns. And so here you have a, a very well-known candidate saying the exact opposite thing, something that, frankly, a lot of gun rights advocates think gun control advocates right. actually want to do in the end, which is, you know, take people's guns away. This is obviously the, the common fear on, uh, uh, among a lot of gun owners. And so, you know, here you have Beto undermining a lot of messaging on on this issue from Democrats and gun control groups. And that's probably one of the reasons you, you don't see them getting very heavily involved in this race. Although also it's kind of a race that I think most people don't believe Beto has a chance of actually winning. Yeah. Um, 
it is funny, like, as you said, you know, he, he touched the ultimate third rail on gun policy where you actually openly say you're going to support gun confiscation. And as, as you pointed out, he's tried uh, to kind of distance himself from that by going on the attack against Greg Abbott. Um, but just to go back to that poll we talked about that came out after a constitutional carry, which, as we've talked about, does typically doesn't poll very well in states um, for various reasons. But still, despite that being in law for six months, uh, Greg Abbott still had a 27 point uh, lead in terms of preferences on gun policy. So it's clear that the at least at this point, the, the extremist line isn't playing well with voters. Um, and I think they're a little more concerned, obviously, with the uh, confiscation, it, it would seem. Yeah, I mean, it, it just seems to be the way that's playing out and also the way that most people would have predicted it to play out, too. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the whole thing is fascinating to watch. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if maybe he reverses himself again at some point in, in the future. I don't know. Particularly during the, the general, you know, primary voting is opened up. We'll see once that wraps up. He's, he's clearly favored to be the Democratic nominee and Greg Abbott's clearly favored to be the Republican nominee. So maybe once general season starts, we'll see some more clarity, yeah. but it'll be interesting. Maybe. Although it feels like he's already running in the general because there's just not sure. really much competition in the Democratic primary, uh, probably because I think most most Democrats don't think it's a winnable race. Uh, you saw some you saw some uh, celebrity attention with right. Matthew McConaughey considering a run early on. But uh, once that faded away, it kind of became Beto's by default. I mean, he's able to raise money for sure. Uh, I think often from both inside the state, but oftentimes a lot of uh, a lot of money from outside the state as well. He's very popular Definitely. with uh, liberal activists nationwide. And so, yeah. We'll keep an eye on the whole thing. You know, we're going to keep people updated on what's what goes on with this race. Um, but Beto's just sort of, uh, you know, it's hard to look at it as anything other than flailing at this point right. when it comes to gun policy, at least. Uh, it seems like that's going to be his weakest issue, perhaps, going into this this race. And the New York Times even talked to voters at the, the Tyler uh, campaign stop where they said, um, you know, that they had, uh, at least their, their husband it was one of the voters they talked to said their husband was considering voting for Beto, except for, uh, his position right. on, on gun confiscation. So uh, it seems like, uh, you know, there's anecdotal and polling evidence to suggest that that position is hurting him uh, significantly in the race. Um, but he's, I guess, standing by it once more and um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it, but, uh, I think that'll do it for us this episode of the Weekly Reload podcast. Make sure, by the way, you go and uh, rate this sh podcast on whatever podcasting app you're listening to or on, uh, you know, give it a thumbs up on, on YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, write a comment. You know, we read all the reviews and try to take in some of the critiques or, or suggestions for what you guys want to see more of or less of or or what have you, and try to incorporate that into the show as best we can. Uh, you know, we're still growing. We're still getting better at this as things go along. And uh, I think we've made a lot of progress, but we're going to continue to take your feedback into account. Uh, but, you know, if you go and, and rate, give us five stars on your podcasting app that'll and leave a review, that'll help us reach more people. Uh, and, you know, feel free to share this far and wide. If you want the podcast date earlier or the opportunity to appear on the show itself. You can buy a membership over at thereload.com. You'll also get access to dozens of exclusive pieces, uh, pieces of you know news reporting or analysis pieces that you can't get anywhere else outside of the reload. So um, we've got monthly memberships, yearly memberships where you get a two month discount effectively on the price. And we also have lifetime memberships for those who want to go above and beyond to try and support what we're doing with this publication, because this is an independent, fully reader funded publication that we have here and we won't survive without our members. And we really appreciate the support we've gotten thus far. Isn't that right, Jake? We've, we've been able to do a lot with uh, relatively little to this point, I think. Yeah, absolutely. We couldn't. Couldn't ask for, for better supporters, and um, we hope if you like what we do here, you uh, share it with friends, family, anyone else that might be interested. Um, 
head just head on over to the reload and get a subscription. Yeah. And uh, that'll help us keep growing, uh, bring more, more people in, be able to do more writing. So please consider buying a membership or at least sharing this content with people you think would be interested. We will see you again next week, though. Thank you.